begin by thanking David uh, Lubinsky for giving me the opportunity to talk with you here this afternoon. It's a real pleasure and honor uh, to be here. I'd also like to begin by apologizing. Uh, actually, probably two apologies. If I can figure out how to work this. Um, what I'm going to talk about was actually the, the uh, subject of a talk at last year's ISR by the eminent economist Adrian Buldrich. Um, I can't hope to match the brilliance of his presentation, but at least I could promise to try to chart a different course. I also want to apologize because I think my talk is a bit parochial. I'm an American, and most of the examples I'm going to give, not all of them, but most of them come from what's going on in America right now. I think it's a very interesting time, challenging time. I think meritocracy is actually under siege in the US, I think also in the UK. I don't know much about other countries. I know a little bit about Denmark. I don't think so much in Denmark. But I'd be very interested in people's experiences in other countries. And the last way, uh, thing by way of just introduction is I want to acknowledge uh, the many uh, great collaborators, colleagues I've had over the years, many of whom are associated with, in one way or another with ISIR. Uh, I benefited greatly from their insights, but it, it almost goes without saying any mistakes or omissions here today are my responsibility only. This is my dad, Bob McGew, and I'm a behavioral geneticist, and my field tells me that his influence on my psychological development ended at the moment of, for the most part, ended at the moment of conception. Now, I'm an ardent behavioral geneticist. I've had my whole career in the field. But I don't accept that. I don't accept that this man only influenced me by the genes he transmitted. When my dad graduated high school, five or six months after that, he was on a ship to Europe. When he came back after the war in 1945, 1946, he joined the Oakland Fire Department. And he spent his entire career at the Oakland Fire Department. Some of the earliest memories I have of my dad were in the summers when after he would wrangle to bed me and my five siblings, he did something extraordinary. Rather than popping a beer, kicking up his, his feet, and watching the next episode of The Honeymooners, he actually retreated to the kitchen and broke out his books and began studying. And my older brothers told me that he would study late into the night. And for me, a young kid who was a bit indifferent to education at that point in my life, I thought the whole thing was bizarre. Why was this man torturing himself studying into the night in the summer? It was until much later that I learned that the Oakland Fire Department, much like many civil service organizations of that era, was in effect a meritocracy. And he was studying because the only way he would ever get promoted was if he aced a promotion examination. What I'm going to talk about today, oh, sorry, I gotta get the system, is the system that really helped my dad be successful and indirectly benefited me. And I'm going to do that and organize it around six questions. What is meritocracy? Meritocracy implies a competition. Who wins and who loses in this competition? The family is actually a complication for, merit, for meritocrats. So we talk about the role of family and whether or not education can ameliorate the distorting effects of the family on meritocratic processes. Finally, a, a term that uh, comes out of the US today, equity, is the attempt not to equalize opportunity, but to equalize opportunity whether or not that's even possible. And finally, is there a meritocracy in our future? The, as, as Wildred shows in his book, the existence of meritocratic societies is, is ancient. It goes back at least to imperial China and the Mandarin examination system. The term is relatively recent, though. It came about in the mid 20th century. It's generally credited as having been created by Michael Young, who I'll get to here in a second. But the actual first published, published use of the term merit, meritocracy 
was by a, a socialist academic, Alan Fox, in 1956. I won't read the quote, but it's a disparaging view of the meritocracy that, of course, existed in England, I'm sure, for about 100 years by that point in the civil service. And it's not surprising that a socialist would have problems with meritocratic processes. It was seen as a, a system for social stratification that is actually, in some ways, more per pernicious than its alternatives because people could argue they were justified in rising to the top. And therefore, it might be more difficult for the, the socialists to, to overthrow. I actually think that Young was probably the first one to use the term meritocracy. Fox, as far as I know, never disputed uh, the credit given Young uh, about the, the term. Uh, Young published his book in 1958, two years after uh, the Fox quote that I just gave you. But um, the, uh, the book, The Rise of the Meritocracy, was actually went, was bounced around a couple of publishers. It probably existed. And I suspect that Fox and Young uh, populated uh, similar circles, social circles at the time. Michael Young was a, a labor politician, a socialist. And he wrote The Rise of Meritocracy in 1958 as a dystopian characterization of what would happen in England after many generations of meritocratic practice. And at the, at the end of this, this he, it was a, meritocracy had won out, and the British and the, were being ruled by what had become a hereditary, isolated, aloof, unempathetic elite. Neither Young nor, nor Fox uh, endorse meritocratic processes. So what is meritocracy? My definition of a meritocratic system is a system that allocates limited educational or occupational opportunities to the individuals who are judged to be most likely to take advantage or succeed in those opportunities, often by some form of assessment. I don't think the meritocracy is actually does, does it actually specify an incentive structure? It's most often seen as being compatible with c capitalism, but I don't see any reason that it's incompatible with something like socialism. In fact, one of the most meritocratic societies today is the, is the PRC, which is arguably not capitalistic at all. I'm not gonna come to Vienna without sneaking in some reference to one of its favorite sons, Hayek. Uh, Hayek was not, uh, he was a critic of meritocratic processes. He did not favor it. Of course, Hayek was a, a free market e economist. And the, what Hayek had a problem with, and I'll come back to this hopefully at the end of the talk, Hayek's concern was that he felt that an individual's value was determined by the market. And that he rejected the notion that individuals could actually predict who would have value. He, he rather would allow that that should go to the market itself. Why meritocracy? It, it, I'm sure there are many arguments in favor of meritocracy. I'm gonna focus on a couple. The first one I've dimmed here a little bit because I don't really buy it. I, I don't think that if I had great SAT scores and a great academic record, that I have some sort of moral claim on a seat at, uh, at next year's uh, uh, freshman class at Harvard. So I, whether or not it's morally justified, I, I guess I will, I'll talk a little bit about moral philosophy here, but not too much, it's not my area. I, I think there's two major arguments in favor of meritocracy. This, the, the second one listed here is uh, to, I guess, to, to paraphrase and, and pervert a little bit of what Winston Churchill said, meritocracy is the worst system other than all others. Nobody, I, to my mind, has ever come up with a better, has articulated a better system than the meritocracy in terms of providing a vehicle for social mobility. The third reason is really, I think, the subject of, of Woltridge's book, and that is that uh, the meritocracy uh, provides a, a mechanism for economic efficiency. It, 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 the, you, you hire the best person, the person most likely to succeed in the job, and that promotes efficiency and it benefits us all. 
The major criticism of meritocratic processes, uh, again, the first I'm not going to talk too much about. Um, I, think the, it, I think the second item here is absolutely true. Meritocracy, at least in its ideal form, is premised on equality of opportunity. We do not, there's no society that has equal opportunity. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I think it also, I don't think it has to, but I think it has exacerbated economic inequality. The, third, the last reason here I, I'm a little bit uncertain about is whether or not it's actually psychologically harmful to the people involved, but I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that as well. There is one other criticism of meritocracy. It actually gets to Michael Young's original concern. Uh, the China Model is a, a book by Daniel Bell. Uh, he's a, a real uh, sino, uh, sinophile. sinophile. Uh, he loves China. <laughs> Sorry. The, uh, apparently, as he writes in his book, apparently in China, uh, politicians are given ability tests early in their careers and advanced accordingly. Um, Young was worried that the meritocracy would play out, that we would get ruled by an isolated meritocratic elite. And in fact, it's hard to argue that that isn't the case. If you look at legislative bodies, parliaments or, or Congress, Overwhelmingly, they're populated by people who have a college degree. In fact, Kenya for a while, I don't think it has anymore, but Kenya had a law that you could only be a member of their Congress if you had a college degree. As best I could tell, every EU leader today has a college degree. And if you look at US presidents, and I'll, I'll challenge the Americans in the room to, to think about who this is, only one in the past 120 years has not had a college degree. And it's not just true of politics. In almost every industry, the people leading the industry are college-educated individuals. It's a competition. Who wins, who loses? Well, it's not going to come as a surprise to anybody in this association, so I'm not going to spend much time on it. But certainly one major factor is general cognibility, GIQ, whatever you want to call it, uh, people like Linda Godfordson, Ian Deary, Charles Murray have, have clearly documented this. I'll, I'll commend this book, this recent book by, I think he's Australian, uh, sociologist maybe, Gary Marks, which is, a, I think, an excellent summary of the literature of, of general cognitive ability and social outcomes. But Michael Young famously wrote the equation that merit equals not only IQ plus effort, and one of the things I've been interested in in my research is what is the effort part of the equation? How can we operationalize that? A lot of the research on the, uh, I'll call them, it's, it's not the best term, but I'll call them the non-cognitive determinants of social success uh, are based on the, co uh, the construct of grit that was introduced uh, by the eminent psychologist Angela Duckworth from uh, the University of Pennsylvania. Um, unfortunately, the, if you look at this literature, at least the published literature on it, it's generated a lot of controversy, a lot of negative uh, publications, questioning the psychometric adequacy of its assessment, as well as its predictive utility. I think there's actually a lot of work to be done to better understand the effort part of Michael Young's uh, equation. In our own work, I've tried to identify in adolescence, we do longitudinal research. We start when, when the participants are in adolescence. We actually finish, follow them up now into middle age. And I've tried, I, I don't argue that this is the best approach, but it's the approach we've taken, to identify components of our assessment that might get at this non-general cognitive ability part of merit. Um, basically, things that uh, in adolescence, individuals who say that they're hardworking, uh, that they, uh, they're willing to delay reward, and that they have confidence that their hard work will actually pay off. And if I f these aren't necessarily highly intercorrelated, by the way, but if I form a composite of these um, personality variables, I find just like general cognitive ability, they're associated with a lot of important social and economic outcomes. Now, I'm not going to argue they're more or less important. I don't know that. If, they're more, if this is more or less important. I actually think they're complementary because it's not very correlated with general cognitive ability. 
It predicts social and economic outcomes. It predicts psychological health. It predicts whether or not you get into trouble. These are all outcomes in middle life of things we assessed in adulthood. It even predicts whether or not you're involved in your community. So two major factors are this non-cognitive component that I don't think is well developed necessarily, but I think also, but very important, and obviously G. The other thing I just want to uh, say before moving on to the next question is this notion that, uh, that the meritocracy is harmful. Harmful not only to those who lose out, but also those who win. Because those who win are spending all their time in these academic pursuits, and they're missing out on life. So they're not happy as they get older. Um, there are, most criticisms of merit, meritocracy actually get into this. This is a book by uh, Michael Sandel, which I recommend highly. I think it's one of the most uh, compelling criticisms of, of meritocracy. Uh, and he talks about that. This, here's a quote here. I tried to identify literature that actually supported these claims that meritocracy was psychologically harmful. It doesn't seem to me out of the question, but is there an empirical foundation to it? Most of the books, interestingly enough, written about criticizing the meritocracy actually come from elite institutions like Harvard, Yale, Cornell, University of London. Not all of them, but most of them. And if you look at the arguments they make in the book, about the psychological harms of meritocracy, their anecdotes about their students. So is there really evidence? Uh, I think it's actually an interesting question. This is very limited and unpublished data um, from our studies. I just wanted to see, oh, well, I, can I see harms in middle age of people that either won or lost this meritocratic race? So I, I have an upward mobility comparison. These are children of parents where the parents did, had no more than a high school degree, but some of them went on to, to have a professional degree, and some of them were like their parents. They only completed high school. And a downward mobility comparison was just the opposite. The parents had a professional degree that's more than college. It's like a PhD or a, a medical degree. Those are their kids that completed college versus, uh, I'm sorry, those who did not complete college versus those who also got a professional degree. The samples aren't large, but I just try to understand the extent to which this is important. I'm going to skip this slide because it just demonstrates the validity of the comparison there. Here in middle life, I've looked at various personality disorders in these individuals, whether or not they're unhappy, anhedonia, anxious, depressed, lack intimacy. That's supposedly what would happen if you're spending all your time studying, whether or not you have life satisfaction. And across the board, again, it's very preliminary. I find no evidence that the people, at least in our sample, that are winning or losing this race are being psychologically harmed. One thing I think that actually probably has uh, some empirical foundation, but again, very little literature, is that people who win the race may have a tendency to be arrogant. This is a study, not that old, 2018. It's kind of a simple study, at least the way I'm representing it here. The, the participants in the study were just asked to rate how, um, how uh, impressive uh, were uh, fictitious characters that varied in terms of their uh, educational background. And the, part, and the raiders themselves also varied in their educational background. And what you can see here is that if the fictitious person had a professional degree, they're rated on a zero to 100 scale. Everybody rated them highly. This is the raiders' education. The blue bars, everybody thinks if you get a professional degree, you have, uh, you have high, high degree of respect. If you didn't get a, uh, no more than a high school degree, then I actually think it's less than a high school degree here, sorry, is that you can see that the most highly educated looked unfavorably on those individuals, knowing only what their educational attainment. So maybe there's some evidence there, although again, it's pretty limited. I think it's an interesting area given the, the repetitive nature of the, the concern being raised. Abolish the family. So the role of the family in 1848, uh, Marx, I think mostly Engels in this case, uh, depending upon your perspective, famously or infamously, wrote about abolishing the family. And for communists, the family is problematic because they're seen as a, a major vehicle for the intergenerational transmission of inequality. 
economic inequality, both directly in terms of wealth transfers, but also indirectly in terms of uh, socialization. Well, Marx and Engels were concerned about the family uh, 150 years ago or more, almost 200 years ago. And it's still the case today that the family is a major vehicle of the transmission of inequality across generations. There's tons of data like this, this happens to be from our study, that shows that if you have parents with a college degree, and in fact, especially if you have two parents with a college degree, you're more likely to get a college degree yourself. And since a college degree is certainly a rung on the meritocratic ladder, you have a leg up depending upon the education of your parents. Critics of meritocracy, I think, legitimately see that as unequal opportunity. That somebody, at the time of their birth, if you have college-educated parents, you're ahead in the race already. You haven't done anything. Other research that I've been involved in, I won't get into the details, suggests that this family effect may be largely owing to uh, the, the impact of, of uh, wealth. Uh, this is from the college paper in Cornell from 2015, so you have to inflate everything quite a bit. But the average salaries of parents sending their kids to elite US universities is phenomenal, even back in 2015. Over 200,000, I guess, at, at Princeton. Uh, it, it also exacerbates, the, the familial transmission of inequality also exacerbates inequality over time. The Great Gatsby curve is a, is a curve uh, developed by, I, I'm, I apologize, it's a little bit uh, blurry here, but it's a curve developed by the economist uh, Alan Kruger. And uh, what it shows is on, along the horizontal axis is um, the, the Gini uh, index, the index of inequality, income inequality in the country, and along the vertical axis is the degree of familial transmission. And what you see is societies, each point is a society, a country. Um, what you see is societies characterized by high degrees of familial transmission, so low that would be low mobility across generations, are characterized by high levels of income inequality. I'm a behavioral geneticist, and I think an interesting question to ask is, do we think about that familial transmission of inequality across generation differently if it's due to the environment the parents are providing versus the genes they're transmitting? That figure that I gave you just a little while ago um, actually is comprised of both biological offspring of parents as well as adopted offspring of parents. And so I can separate them out here. And on the left panel are the adopted offspring, and on the right, these are the sample sizes, and on the right are the non-adopted, so they're genetic offspring of the kids. And what you can see is that there's an effect in both cases. That is, if your adoptive parent has a college degree, you're more likely to, to, to finish college as well. Um, the effect is stronger in the non-adopted this reflects both genes and the environment. That reflects only the environment. So both are going on here. The reason that kids, not surprisingly, the reason that kids of parents who have a college degree are more likely to get a college degree are twofold. One is that they've inherited genes that increase the likelihood that they're going to get a college degree. And secondly, they're also growing up in an environment that somehow provides a stimulus to get a college degree. And again, I think that has to do primarily with the income of those families. This is my only f other foray into moral philosophy, which I'm, I, again, I'm not, so I, I, I should probably stay away from this. But there's actually an in interesting debate ongoing right now in behavioral genetics in, in, in precisely this area. If we think about those effects, those familial transmission effects, as what behavioral geneticists would call the shared environment, I get an advantage because my, my parents are wealthy. That's some sort of exogenous factor to me. I don't think I have any, I, I can't take, I don't think any credit for my parents' wealth. For the moral philosophers, I don't deserve any of the dessert. I like the, the, uh, the, the eating, uh, uh, metaphor here. Um, so I think if, if it's easy to see when we're talking about the environment that the, 
what, my parents' wealth, I don't deserve any credit for those. But what about my genes? What about my genetics? Do I have any moral claim to the benefits associated with the genes I got from my parents? Now, that's actually something that, behavioral, oddly enough, behavioral geneticists are debating at the moment. I think most of the debate is on the side that no, I, it, it, although I'm not going to agree with that, but, but I think most of the debate is uh, on the side that you don't deserve any credit. These, you just got those. those were just, that was just luck. Um, uh, most prominently by uh, the, uh, a well-known behavioral geneticist from the University of Texas has articulated this argument, Paige Harden. I think, I, I'm not sure, I, I think John Rawls would, certainly John Rawls talked about genetics. I think he would also be classified as a luck egalitarianism. The term luck egalitarianism is actually coined after Rawls's Theory of Justice book. Other, um, other prominent uh, moral philosophers and sociologists here th th who've argued that, no, you, you, don't, you don't deserve anything. Your genes are just randomly distributed to you. You didn't do anything to deserve those. And so you need to compensate. That's part of the common good, your genes. And so you need to compensate people that were less lucky by some sort of income transfer or whatnot. I actually have a lot of reservations about that. I'll articulate a couple here. One is, it's a very deterministic view of human behavior. I got the genes, therefore that explains what I achieved in life. I, I don't think genetics quite works that way. I think it also is a kind of a dismal view of human nature. I, I can't imagine a, a society where every month I got a check from the government to compensate me for my low talent that I couldn't compete with other people. So, there is another perspective Oh, this is a quote from Michael, Michael Young's uh, son, Toby Young, uh, who's actually won an award from ISIR. It just shows that uh, the, the, all the people on the previous slide I would classify as being progressive. Uh, I, I think Toby Young, I, think it, I hope it's fair, I think he's more on the conservative end of the spectrum. So both con conservatives and liberals have, have a problem with the genes you inherit and whether or not you deserve anything out of it. Another moral philosopher, I won't get it too far into this, Thomas Nagel talked about different types of luck. But I like the idea. There's purely exogenous. I get struck by lightning. I win the lottery. I didn't do anything to, do, to, to, to earn that. But there's also luck, like my genes, that actually constitute who I am. And to a certain degree, however I got those genes, they convey to me some responsibility to act. I think without something like that, we have there's no responsibility because everything in it, to a certain degree is luck. I think most Americans, I don't know about the rest of the world, most Americans will recognize that families provide advantages or sometimes disadvantages to the children they raise and they're okay with that to a certain extent. That, nepotism is the way kind of the family should work. You should try to provide opportunities for your kids. But most would also want some sort of compensating mechanism. And the question is, can education serve that role? Horace Mann was a very famous American, I actually I think from Massachusetts, educator of the 19th century. He saw education as the great equalizer. So we think about the effect of an educational program. There's four possibilities, I would say. Two of them I don't think have much empirical support, so I'm not going to talk about them much. That the the educational uh, program had no effect. Going to school had no effect. I, I think the, the work of Stuart Ritchie and Elliot Tucker Drobe shows that, yes, education has an effect. Um, the different lines are different ability levels. Uh, the other possibility is what Horace Mann hoped for, is that education would actually reduce the inequality that existed prior to the educational allocation. I don't, I, I don't think there's much uh, support for that either. The other two possibilities, I think, are possibilities. Uh, one is called the Matthew effect for a, 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 a verse from the, I guess, the New Testament, um, that what education might do is actually expand ability differences. 
Uh, and then finally, independent effects, that you have pre-existing ability differences and you have an education effect, but education affects everybody the same way. I got interested in this in the context of a movement that I assume most of you are aware of now, it's really phenomenal, is the College for All movement. And here's a quote from uh, Barack Obama about wanting to get everybody a college education. And they've been very successful in getting, at least in most countries, this is, I know it's very hard to see, the OECD, over one generation, the number of people that have, uh, with a college degree versus the previous generation. The top one there is uh, the Republic of Korea, South Korea. In South Korea, the, in one generation, the number of people with a college degree increased threefold. 70% of young South Koreans have a college degree. Phenomenal. Uh, the U.S., of course, is somewhere there in the middle. There is, a, a, there is a couple of exceptions. A notable one is Germany. Germany has increased the number over a generation from 27 to 33 percent, but it's kind of a, a minor increase. And I think actually that's an important difference with most of the world. But there's been this push to get everybody a college education. And what I got, I'm not pushing or pulling on this, but I'm trying to understand, well, is it beneficial? And we've collected data, again, longitudinal data, and I could compare the parent generation to the offspring generation to see if in our sample, these are all from Minnesota, we get the same expansion of college education. And indeed we do, uh, women on the left, men on the right. But right, if you're, if, if you're expanding, uh, in the US now about 50% of young people have a college degree. If you're expanding at that level, then you have to be grabbing people from throughout the IQ distribution. That has to be the case. And so one of the things we found, and I got interested in, is a little bit hard to see here, but in, uh, in the women, the low GCA group are people with IQs below 90 or below. The number of them with a college degree increased over tenfold in women in one generation, and about sixfold in men. So these are individuals with an IQ below 90 that you wouldn't normally think would go to school, but are going to school at increasing rates in part because of the college for all movement. Do they benefit from college? The answer that we found is that I, I can't claim that these are causal effects, but the, uh, the correlates of college suggest that they are benefiting as much from college as are the high IQ individuals. They're not benefiting more, they're not benefiting less, or you're not getting convergence, or you're not getting the Matthew effect. It looks like the independent effects model. So that in terms of their occupational status, uh, these are the different, whoops, sorry, different uh, levels of IQ here, the three groups. Ah, I won't try. yeah. So this is the low IQ group, and this are, again, in midlife, their occupational status, their income, these are all standardized effects. Whether or not they're economically independent, they're not on government assistance, for example. Whether or not they stay uh, out of trouble with the law. Now, I don't know that college causes all these, but what the data suggests is that indeed, what might be considered a rather remarkable group, individuals with IQs below 90, I'm sure they struggled, and many of them may have dropped out, but they seemed, if they can complete the degree, they seem to get the same benefits as everyone else. Equity. So equity in the US, I don't know if it's used similarly elsewhere, but it's, it's, it's shifting from equality of opportunity to trying to achieve equality of outcome. And to a certain extent, it might reflect a frustration with our ability to equalize opportunity. Kurt Vonnegut is a famous American novelist. He's dead now. Uh, best known as an anti-war uh, writer, he wrote a very famous novel, Slaughterhouse-Five. Some of you might have heard of it. But early in his career, he wrote a short story, uh, Harrison Bergeron. It's also dystopian. I guess people are prone to dystopian <laughs> stories in this area. Um, in which, in this case, it's the US. And, and he, he describes where the US actually passed some constitutional amendments mandating equal, equal outcome. And 
so he describes a society. So in the society, the only way they could actually achieve equal outcome is by handicapping the most advantaged people. So the beautiful ballet dancers had to wear weights. So they, they shouldn't be dancing too nicely be, to, to compensate. Or if you were physically attractive, you were given a mask that you had to wear. Or if you were bright, you were, they, they put something in your ear and, and every, randomly every 10 seconds you would get a loud burst of noise that would disrupt your cognitive processes. We hope we don't come to this, but, um, but I think families are not only a, a source of unequal opportunity, they also illustrate the challenges of trying to equalize outcome. This has been noted by several eminent individuals, uh, most prominently the economist, the American economist Thomas Sowell, who makes the point, <laughs> a very valid point, that if you look within a family and could, we, could society ever hope to equate the environment that a child grows up in more than a family does? If you look within a family, there's extraordinarily, extraordinary diversity of out, social outcomes in the children raised in that same family. So, Sol and actually before him, Christopher Jenks, the famous sociologist, argued you're, you're never going to be able to equalize opportunity. Because here, it, it doesn't happen. And in fact, in our research, I'll go through this because I don't want to take up more than my time. I won't try to explain the slide. We've, we've actually shown that this unequal outcome within the family is not capricious. That individuals with greater talent in the family are the ones that are more likely to move up, and the ones with less talent are more likely to move down. So it doesn't seem like, e equalizing opportunity, it, we'd, I don't think we have, we have any known way of doing that that could achieve what we hope to achieve. So if we can't achieve equity by homogenizing, homogenizing opportunity, maybe what we need to do is, as the Silicon Valley people talk about, disrupt the system. And how do we disrupt the system? You, you guys know this better than I do, but I, I think it's pretty fascinating. For example, you could eliminate, eliminate the use of standardized tests. Um, the problem with that is, that if you, as you probably all know, standardized tests for the SAT was originally created to, it, to create opportunity for individuals who wouldn't go to elite uh, US universities otherwise. That's the whole purpose of, of creating the test. And remarkably, even progressive people recognize that value of the test. Alexander, Alexandria Ocasio, Cortez uh, is a very charismatic uh, progressive American politician. And here's a quote from her that said that, well, thank God for that standardized test when I was in school. Because without it, I may not have gotten out of remedial education and, and, and had the political career I have. I doubt she's a big fan, though, to be honest. I, I suspect she's probably not a big fan of standardized tests, so to be fair to her. Um, and she's right. There's evidence, I, I won't go through much of this, just as the only study I'll mention, this is from David Card, that's showing that standardized tests can be used to create opportunity. But as you'll see, I'm actually no big fan of standardized testing. But I think it's a big mistake to just throw them out the window and not replace them with some alternative method of assessment. This, what they showed in this study, I won't try to go through the graph, I apologize is that universal screening for gifted education using standardized tests actually increase the yield of minority students in gifted programs. The problem with getting rid of standardized tests and not replacing it with anything is that they're predictive. And if you don't <laughs> replace it with something that's equally predictive, hopefully, then you get all kinds of untoward uh, consequences. You get high rates of failure and dropout. You get relaxation of grading standards. So grade, grades are going up unbelievably. Uh, elimination of gifted programs, academic tracking, which is happening quite a bit in the US now. This is, I think, the most troubling to me, is the last one. There's debate now in the US about getting rid of licensing exams and credentialing exams because of their disparate impact. In particular, the, the bar exam in the US is where lawyers have to pass the bar exam to be certified to practice law. And it's a tough exam and many people fail. And many law schools now are arguing there shouldn't be a bar exam. If they graduated from accredited bar uh, law school, 
They should be able to practice. Bulldrich talks about the City University of New York. I think it's actually a very interesting and maybe a little bit more complex example than, than Wooldrich. He didn't cover it that much in his book, maybe half a page. So the University of, of New York is actually a system. Uh, it was called the Harvard of the Proletariat. Jews were discriminated against for admission into elite uh, Ivy uh, universities in the US uh, throughout much of the early 20th, uh, through the mid 20th century. And as an alternative, many Jews then went to the City University of New York. It had very rigorous admission standards. It has, among its alumni, 13 Nobel laureates. But in 1969, the City University of New York became an open institution. You could go, many countries have open universities. I'm not sure if Austria has it. Certainly, the UK does. Michael Young actually was instrumental in starting the open university system in, in the UK. But an open university is where, in this case, if you had a high school degree from a New York City high school, then you, you were admitted, automatically admitted to the City University of New York. So there were no admission standards beyond that degree. Heather McDonald is very bright, very courageous. I don't always agree with her, but she's very bright. A person who's written an article about this, so it's a little bit old, but it's, it's good. It's an interesting article. Um, what the, as a consequence of the open practice, getting rid of the standardized test, for example, they had to institute all kinds of remedial education, and the dropout rates just exploded. 75, up to 75% of students just gave up. So it's hard to argue that it was an efficient educational system. I think some of the, again, there are multiple campuses here. I think some of them have actually reinstituted some sort of evaluation of applicants, but I don't think all of them. Can we conclude then that it was a failed experiment? McDonald concludes that, and again, she, she articulates a very compelling argument from my perspective. But I don't think they failed. I think what they did is they changed the game. They had a different set of goals. And for their goals, they've actually been very successful. The economist Rod Chetty, I, keep tra I, can't, I lose track of where he goes. He's an American. Uh, I, he might be at MIT or Stanford. He's at some illustrious. He's a very interesting uh, labor economist, I guess. And he developed what he called, it's arbitrary, but he, it, it, a little ad hoc, but he developed what he called the mobility index. And a mobility index, in his case, is defined as if you start life, your parents are in the lowest 20% of the income distribution, what's the chance you get to the upper 20%? And just at random, if you had a random system, then 20% of 20% is 4%. So 4% would be a random system. In the US, only a little bit less than 1% of the people from the lowest, start at the lowest quintile, actually end up at the top. And you could say one thing universities should aspire to do is move people up the income distribution. That's what Ross Chetty has investigated. Elite US universities like Harvard and Yale achieve a rate of 2.2%, so a little bit better than, than the overall average, but not great. It's a little bit hard to see here, but the SUNY system is actually very good at moving people from the lowest quintile of income up to the highest. It's not a, a, a phenomenal percent, but again, Brandon, remember, is 4%. The elites are doing 2%. They're up at 7%. If you talk to people, I haven't, but if you talk to people, administrators at SUNY, I would think that they think their system is actually quite good, but they have a different set of goals. Okay, last thing to finish up. Is there a meritocracy in our future? Again, the answer, I think, I think it's hard to imagine, at least for me, I'm not imaginative, hard to imagine a system without meritocracy. These are various criticisms I've called from uh, critiques of the meritocratic system. I'm not gonna go through each one of these, but if you look at them, some of them don't make any sense, like, it, it, which is a common retort in the US. Well, we need to invest more in, in early interventions, but there's a lot of research that suggests that that won't work. Uh, some, I think, do, do make sense, like uh, uh, trying to reduce inequality. The, the top are, are, to me, kind of very odd. 
uh, let's get more people to go to college. I'm not sure how that's going to help. I think that probably would hurt. Or to, to admit uh, people to elite colleges by lottery. Um, I apologize to people from elite colleges, but I think it's a little bit, I think that's actually a little bit arrogant to think that the small percentage of people that go to elite colleges are the, the source of the problem here. In fact, most critics, if you read critics of the meritocracy, when they get to the end, if it's a book or an article, and they're supposed to talk about what their alternative is, they throw up their hands and say, I don't know, but I do know that we don't have one. And, and if you look, none of these is giving you a replacement to, for the meritocracy. Fareed Zakaria is a, it's a, 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 a political commentator in the, in the US, and he makes the point that we are going to be we are going to be ruled by an elite, and the question is, and there, there will be people running Google and running the government, and that who is who are we going to pick to do that? How are we going to pick those people? I think there's real disconnect between academic concerns and the general public. The general public are extraordinary supporters of meritocracy. What do you do when you want? I don't know, but some of you in the U.S. If you want, if you're if you're uh, toilet is leaking, your car is not working, you want the best to fix your, your leaking faucet or your, your broken car. You go to something like Yelp. These are the, in millions, the number of reviews in, in Yelp. I looked at two, um, two national, international surveys to, to, to look at, uh, to try to gauge popular support for meritocratic practices. The first here is the International Social Survey Program. 41 countries, uh, the one limitation of this is the 41 countries are mostly developed economies. Uh, I think there's one African country, for example, and I think it's South Africa. Um, it, it, but it's, the, it's limited in that way. But it's interesting in that the, the, there's large samples, 56,000 individuals, and they rate the extent to which getting ahead economically in their country the extent to which it's uh, related to what I'd call privilege, having a wealthy family, connections, I formed scales out of these, merit, working hard, getting a, a good education, or their identity, their race, their religion, their gender. So I formed scales, and all of these are, are rated on a one to five scale. So what they're rating is how important these factors are in, in getting ahead in their country. And there are 41 different countries on this one to five scale. And one and two are negative, four and five are positive, and three is, well, yes or no, it's right in the middle. This is a, a plot of the results. And it, it's blue if they're on the positive end, it's red if they're on the negative end. Um, and again, three is, is the middle. Every country, the, on average, of course there are individuals that don't see that, in the, that way in the country, but every country recognizes, or at least believes, that they have, a, to some degree, a functioning meritocracy. And that things like their identity is actually rated very low across the board. I, I forget what the exception is. I won't try to, to go down. Um, it, and privilege is actually even not considered that, that important. The, that's how they see their country operating. Do they support it? I looked at data from a different survey called the World Value Survey. This is a larger survey, 59 countries, 86,000. And, and in this case, uh, I haven't formed scales, but they rate on a zero to, uh, no, one to 10 scale, the importance of, or the, the, their value of whether or not they want their economy to work by increasing incentive versus equalizing income. Almost every country said they'd rather see increasing incentives. Whether or not competition is good, almost every country is on the positive side. Only two were not. Whether or not in their country they think it's important for hard work to get ahead. Again, there's a couple of exceptions, but overwhelmingly in the world, people endorse a meritocracy because they believe it's a vehicle to get ahead. And I don't think we'll ever get rid of a meritocracy unless you can satisfy, they don't see the alternative to what is certainly an imperfect system. So, um, I'll skip to finish up here. 
I think meritocracy will, will persist. The advantages are, I think Wolder shows us, it, 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 it increases economic productivity and efficiency. I think most important, it has that public support because it, at least it's an identifiable, not everybody does move up, for sure, and, and many move down as well, but at least there's an opportunity. People feel they can take controls of at least some aspects of their life. The disadvantages, I think, are recognizable. Equality of opportunities, I don't think, can ever be attained. Um, it does exacerbate income inequality. It does lead to a rule by, and maybe we're all satisfied with being ruled by uh, a college elite, but I think it's Sandell, it might be Markovitz, or maybe both. Uh, one of the, the arguments they advance is that, well, the, mer we, the meritocracy is the reason for the populism that you see in many countries now as they rebel against the elite. I don't know if it's psychologically harmful. It could be, I, I just don't know. I, I, I'm not gonna worry too much about its moral, moral arguments. And if it makes people arrogant, I'm willing to. I, listen, I've lived my life with arrogant people, so I can, I can, I can deal with that. I should end here, but I, I'm a behavioral geneticist, and behavioral geneticists really learn early in your careers. If you want to have a career, you don't say anything about public policy. But I think it would be unfair I criticize other people. And it's going to be lame anyway, but I'll tell you what I think. If, if I, God forbid, if I had the power to change things, what I would focus on. So, and you can get angry at me, that's okay. I think Hayek had a point. I said I don't like standardized, I, I actually think standardized tests are very useful in certain contexts. I don't like them for admissions testing, but I recognize they're valid. I think people, I, I think they've lost support of many people in the US. I'd be very surprised if in 10 years, colleges are still using standardized tests. I would hope they would replace them with something else. I think more important, then predicting what you're going to do is what you've already done. And I think that's how we should be evaluated. That's the, f the first thing. The second thing is I do think that the economic system isn't necessarily linked inextricably to the meritocratic processes. And I think, in my opinion, I think we need to do more about reducing in income inequality. However, I, I don't think that Income is the answer, equalizing, or not, certainly not equalizing income. I, I think, and this is where I really, I, I commend the book to you. I commend two books here, the one by Gary Marks and the other by Michael Sandel. It's a very interesting book, an important book. And that he makes the point that it isn't just like my getting the check in the mail every day, every month, and, and am I feeling good about myself? I'm not gonna feel good about myself necessarily. And there needs to be, some redefinition of, of worth. And, it, and, and many of us came to appreciate that more during the pandemic when we saw what other various people contributed to the functioning of society. I don't think Sandel actually has, he calls it a, a contributive justice perspective. I, I think it's an excellent idea. I don't think he has necessarily a, a lot of good ideas about how to achieve it though. But it's an excellent point. I, I would say we should reconsider the College for All uh, initiative. I think it's probably a mistake, although I, I recognize that the people who say college for all is a mistake tend to be people with a college education. The other thing is, and this gets back maybe to Germany, is that at least in my country, there needs to be a reconsideration of vocational education and professionalization of work. I've, I've worked many years in Denmark, and one of the things I've appreciated, there are many things I appreciate about Denmark, but one of the things I appreciate is my imperfect understanding of their society, is the professionalization of work at every level, and the respect and recognition of the contributions that people make at every level. Okay, I'm off my soapbox. My dad, I come back to my dad. My dad was good at taking those tests, and he moved right up the ladder. He got promoted, and uh, every time he got a promotion, we would have a party at the house, and all his Irish firefighting buddies would come. That was, boy, was that impressive, how they could party. And it was a lot of fun. And my dad got promoted to the highest level you could through a test. He became the assistant chief, one of the assistant chiefs, I think they had two or three, at the Oakland Fire Department. But he never made the last leap that last step to become the full chief. 
that last step was not meritocratic. It was a political appointment. And I remember by that time I was in college and I remember kind of resenting that. Maybe I enjoyed all the parties. I really love my dad. And I thought he should get the top job. And I regret actually never asking him how he felt about it. But I remember I had a recent conversation with some of my brothers. And we came to the conclusion that he probably didn't resent it at all. That he had had a good career. And that he recognized that what he had achieved, that that last step, there were other factors that needed to be considered. And he did not fit the bill. And I think, although I don't know, I think he was probably very comfortable and satisfied with that. And I've come to, to actually think that he was probably, if he did think that way, he was probably right. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for your talk. Um, it's a little bit past six o'clock, but if you've got still five minutes uh, and want to wait for uh, this time, we've got still time for two or three questions, I guess. Um, have you got the second mic somewhere? Hi there, thanks for a fantastic, fantastic talk, Matt. Uh, my name's Damien. Um, I, uh, you brought up Hayek a few times in your presentation. Um, Hayek warned that we risk getting trapped in a false dichotomy between meritocracy and uh, um, uh, egalitarianism. Uh, and by meritocracy, he meant equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome. I, I think a lot of the tensions that you're talking about in your talk are about how we define meritocracy. And I think a lot of, the, uh, a lot, you know, it's, it's a word game about what merit consists of that causes a lot of the, the political debates that we have about it. But uh, trying, uh, getting to the main thrust of what I wanted to say, uh, it was almost heretical to say, but what Hayek uh, argued is that it's not obvious that equality of opportunity is actually even desirable, even if it were possible. Um, and, and just to, to kind of flesh out that idea, like, why should my children have all the advantages of somebody else's children if they toiled and saved while I idled and frittered away my, my resources? Why should there not be intergenerational transmission of environmental as well as genetic advantages? And why shouldn't we reward excellence however it was come by? And I think that's getting into what, you, what you're getting at in your talk. Why shouldn't we reward excellence however it was come by, regardless of whether it's genetic, regardless of whether it's environmental, uh, when it increases the common wheel, as it, as it basically does in a market economy, in a free, liberal market economy like the kind of society most of us live in. So, so first of all, I have to pause. My hearing is bad. <laughs> so, uh, so, but I try. I think I understood the part of the question, or maybe the whole question, is if, if it's environmentally, if, if, if families are able to, to environmentally create opportunities for the kids, is there anything wrong with that? And I, I, no, I, I'm, I'm not opposed to that. What, what I was trying to get at in, in terms of the college example here is that you could think of families that created opportunities that then built skills in their children. They had higher cognitive ability or, or, or or they were able to delay reinforcement longer. Our data doesn't suggest that's how families are operating. It suggests that families are operating somehow because of the income they have. And so it's, it, it, and I think that's kind of a distortive process. So I, I, don't, I don't think that's good. I think certainly families creating, I, I think that's how families work and, and they should create opportunities. I certainly try to do that with my daughter, so. I don't know if I'm answering your question. Well, if I don't want to hold the time, but I, I suppose if I'm going to attack you here, as if it's yeah, if, trying to just hear you. <laughs> if Elon Musk created a private school for his own kids uh -huh. and some of his own workers, that could somehow, you know, just educate kids better than anyone has ever been educated before environmentally, that creates inequality of opportunity, not just inequality of outcome. Is that okay? I think it is. I think it is okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I, I'm sorry. I, I, I certainly think it is okay. Um, 
I, I'm actually very, I, I'm happy my daughters are through school because I couldn't imagine navigating the, the U.S. school system anymore. I just, it's frightening. I mean, I know James has young kids. It, 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 it's very uneven, the, the school. So, but good parents are going to try to identify good schools for their kids. And I, th I think, I don't know how much of an effect that has is all I'm saying, but I think, I think that's certainly legitimate. And I don't think you, I mean, right with Hayek, I think one of the things is, is that a lot of the proposals, a lot of the critics of, the, of meritocracy and the proposals they advance really involve taking away freedom. And even if parents are doing things that are ineffective, I think they should have the freedom to at least explore that. I shouldn't, as an academic, say, no, you, or a politician, say you can't do that. So. Hi, Matt. Matt, this was a great talk. Thank you for giving it. Um, I have a, sort of a two-part question, and they're related. I was wondering if you could comment on the number of examples we have in our culture about that we have people talking out of two sides of their mouth, so to speak, when it comes to merit. I mean, you actually have people denying that there's a concept like merit. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and yet, they're often the same people who, if they need a heart surgeon, or if their house is burning down, or if they need legal defense for something unfair that has happened, they talk about wanting the best. So there's, there's really, an, I see a lot of asymmetries in, in, um, the narratives that are developed. I think we're meritocrats. I, 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 I don't know anybody who it's anything else. Yeah. The Yelp reviews. That you, you get sick with cancer, you want the best cancer doctor. And yeah. yeah, so yeah. The, the other part to this is, and I don't know this literature, but have, have people looked at dating websites in terms of what people are looking for in partners? Oh, no, I, maybe somebody has. In, I, I don't know. In t because I bet the attributes they, they are after are correlated highly with the traditional concepts of merit. Yeah. They, the, the, the first part I'll just comment on very quickly. I don't want to, if I'm keeping people from a drink or something, I don't want to. We talked about this a little bit. I, at my university, uh, like many universities in the U.S. now, they, we have uh, Zoom. They're now on Zoom diversity training. So I, I actually think there's some important goals there. So I thought I would take the, <laughs> James will get upset with me. Maybe I, mean, but I thought I'd take the diversity training and and learn a little bit about the you know how how other people think about it. I had to drop out out of after the second session because the person, <laughs> the diversity trainer, came on and said. Well, we all know that there's no such thing as the meritocracy. And you can't bring that up in here. That's just, <laughs> this is at a university. And so you're right. The people, it's, there's an anti-intellectualism <laughs> that, that goes along. In, it exists in US universities these days that you, there are certain things that, this is true. Meritocracy, no, doesn't exist. You can't, you can't question that. That's, I'm the expert. That's it. So, uh, Sir. Yep, just a couple of quick suggestions uh, to refine two points you made. So the okay. first is on luck egalitarianism. Okay, yeah, uh, okay, John, we're gonna go. Okay. John Rawls's colleague, uh, which Steve probably knew at some point, Robert Nozick, um, has a chapter in his reply to Rawls, Anarchy, State, and Utopia, in which he distinguishes between desert and entitlement. And he yeah. says, look, of course we don't deserve our genes. We don't deserve things that we have no capacity to choose. Nevertheless, that doesn't mean you're not entitled to, in some moralistic sense, the genetic endowment that you end up with and yeah. the things that you do with that genetic endowment. Now, you need a lot of moral distinctions to okay. flesh that out. You don't have to be a Lockean yeah. like Nozick is. Mm -hmm. But anyway, that's a quick suggestion. No, actually, where, can I? Did, yeah, of course. I meant when I talked about whether or not I had moral justification. I appreciate the point. Of course, I agree with you yeah. 100%. 
Nozick's book is, is brilliant. Sure. I meant to say that I might not be, have a moral claim on being admitted to Harvard, but given Harvard's system, I probably was, would be entitled to be yeah. admitted to Yeah, so that's one way to flesh yeah. it out. I Good. think that's an important point. Thank you. The, the main point, though, that I was going to make is on, lucky, or sorry, on equality of opportunity. So I think yeah, most sensible people think equity is a fantasy for a bunch of reasons. There's increasing marginal costs to get there. But by the same logic, as you suggested, equality of opportunity is difficult, even though it's something we all kind of want to move toward, right? Mm -hmm. The reason being, as many people here would know, once you equalize opportunities in the social sense, you still don't equalize them genetically. Yeah, yeah. And Judith Dar at UCLA has a book, and there are many moral philosophers who have written this. Look, one way around this is, not around it, but to say, I'm going to bite the bullet, and we should subsidize genetic enhancements once they become available. Now, there's a big difference between that and, of course, coercive eugenics. And so one thing that you can say is, look, if you really want to get to equity or even equality of opportunity beyond equalizing the social environment, you would literally need coercive eugenics. Nobody supports that. So you don't actually support equality of opportunity. It's kind of reductio of the position that we really should aim to achieve literal full equality of opportunity. Let me know what you think about that. I, well, I can say for sure I don't yeah. support eugenics. Well, I'm talking about in the no, literal no, sense coercive eugenics. Nobody does. I, that's the it's point. An that's by itself an interesting conversation. Yeah. I, but but uh, I, I think you're right. We're, we're never going to equalize opportunity. I, I agree with that. It, it, there's always going to be some people advantage it, by virtue of the genes they inherit or the, the homes they're reared in. To, to me, that the important thing is, the, I, it's, it sounds trivial, or, or it's, 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 is to, to respect everybody's contribution and to, and to allow them the opportunity to perfect. There's a wonderful quote, actually. I, I should have put it in. And maybe you know the quote from Martin Luther King. I didn't put it in. Do you know the quote? It's the quote where he was, I don't know, maybe in Memphis or something, about street cleaners, I think it is. And he said, if you want to be a street cleaner, you want to be the best street cleaner there is, and you want to perfect your skill. I didn't put it in because I thought it would be off-putting. But when I read it, it isn't off-putting. I think he's absolutely right. And that we, we should respect people not only for economically, but for the, the value that they're contributing to society. So I don't know if I'm answering your question. but Should we end? or? You, you decide, Jakob. Well, it depends a little bit if everyone is already thirsty, but I think we'll have a great opportunity also upstairs okay, if you come to, uh, to, to settle uh, any more questions that might be there. And we've got three days of conference left. James, you want to add something? Um, I wonder if we could look at this concept and then we're going to eat. We definitely are. This idea of genetic luck. I would argue you would only say you were lucky, if it was random, if you were conceived at a mass, uh, a mass masked orgy. Then it's luck. Yeah. But how dare anyone say, for the 98% chance of actuality, that you choose someone because you think you can get on with them and have children with them. That's not luck, that's a, that's a choice. Yeah. So I think a lot of the language you're using is false consciousness. You're saying unequal uh, outcomes. Who said they were ever going to be equal? They don't have to be. Yeah. You're almost saying that the things that parents are handing on are unfair. Your dad handed on two things, all right? He handed on you, and as far as we know, Greg Clark would say, he did his job and that's it. The reading at the, at the table is nothing. You and I think there's a bit more there. But it wasn't that you were lucky in any conceptual moral sense. He could say, I had my children, I chose my wife, I brought up my kids. And who says that someone else comes to steal with me, steal from me, when I've handed that on to my kids? It's yours. You're using the language of the oppressor, which is in this case, hey, you're doing pretty well as a family, I'm going to come and get a bit of that. I, I, yeah, that okay. Um, it, it, actually, you don't know this, but my kids are adopted. So <laughs> but okay. But anyway, I don't know if they got lucky with me. But 
you have to ask them. Uh, but if they were biological, I, yes, I chose a mate. That and so it's it's not a random process for me, but it is. My kids, going back to the philosopher's terms, they don't get any any dessert for the genes they get from you know from whomever. So I, I do think that that's. I think it's a valid thing to think about. Um, it, it, we. It, it, on the one hand, we we don't we don't actually create the genes that come to us. At this, the other hand, if aside from things like Huntington disease, which is hard to say anybody has responsibility for inheriting those, but if, but we we do bear some credit and responsibility for who we are, and how our genes then are manifested in our behavior. So maybe I'll leave it at that. <laughs> I'm getting tired anyway. So thank you very much, Dave. Thank you. For the Okay, thanks. So let's uh, perhaps go upstairs. You can find some signs which will lead you to the court.